good morning to all of you. I don't know if you realize it or not, but we are actually wrapping up the book of Exodus today. I didn't know that until this week either. <laughs> it, it's kind of funny. We've been in this at least 29 weeks. I, I may be off my count a little bit there. Uh, but we've been, including this week, at least 29 weeks, maybe 30 weeks, going through 40 chapters of Exodus. Um, that's not bad. That's not, not quite a chapter a week. So that, that's success there, in my opinion. Um, but I didn't realize we were going to be finishing Exodus today because we have, you know, six chapters left, right? But they largely cover one topic. And so it's like, okay, great. We're, we're going to treat this all in one sermon. The amazing thing about that is um, because this is the last Sunday we're in Exodus, it, it coincides with the fact that this is the last Sunday until all February that we really have three if we were going to come back to topic of Exodus, because next week, what, what do we have next week? The community worship service at the Ogden Community Center, so we're there at 11 next week. After that, we're starting into Advent with all the Christmas preparations, and then in January, um, Nate is going to be here, and he's going to preach, yeah, I almost forgot his name, sorry Nate, <laughs> um, be here for four weeks in um, January. So it'd be February. Another person, well, I got other stuff to move on to in, in February. But here we are, and boom, it is the last week, and it is the last week. So it worked out great. Now, you might think, I mean, Vicki was like, wow, Kevin, you, you scheduled that just perfectly. I'm like, you have no idea. I, I don't plan that far ahead. I know where we're going, and I look at the scripture, and I kind of have a general idea, but, you know, we deal with what we deal with. I mean, we spent, what, three or four weeks in the Ten Commandments. That's one chapter. And here we are. We're going to squeeze uh, six chapters into one sermon. We're not reading all six chapters. Okay. Y'all can go do that later. But I thought before we look at these chapters and where they're going, we should kind of do a quick summary uh, of some of the highlights that we've picked up going through uh, the book of Exodus. First... God's plan is greater than human need, human mistakes, and human powers. If you remember, the family of Israel, Jacob's family, left the promised land because of a great drought. And they were in need, and, and there were plenty of mistakes made, but they come down into Egypt, and guess who's in charge there? Joseph. And Joseph was that beloved younger son who was hated by all his brothers and sold into slavery. But God used that to bring Joseph up. So Joseph was basically in charge of Egypt. Pharaoh was the king, and Joseph ran everything. I mean, that's just great. God saves his people through the, the mess-ups and the evil of Joseph's brothers. But later, you know, man steps in and does what we do, and the Egyptians forgot about Joseph and the fact that he totally saved the entire nation from the, uh, the drought. And it says there was a new pharaoh, right? And, and that pharaoh had this thing against the Israelites because there were so many of them. So he's like, hey, let's start killing all the Israelite babies. And that went over <coughs> really well. Um, he couldn't get people to do it, so he finally had to have everybody just, hey, you see a, a Hebrew baby, grab it, throw it in the river. Not a great day, but in the midst of that, there's this one little baby. Who? Moses. Moses, that's right. God spares Moses in the process of all that. And he not only spares him, he brings Moses into Pharaoh's household. So Pharaoh ends up raising Moses. His daughter makes Moses her child. And so here you have all of this coming together. You've got human need. I mean, they, there was a drought. You have human uh, mistakes and evil. And yet, through all of this, the abuse of human power, where Pharaoh is just doing horrible things, but nothing, nothing of all of it is comparable to the power of God and the certainty of his plan. Pharaoh had his idea, but God was still making sure he accomplished what he wanted. Number two, God is patient. God is patient. He lets us try things our way, and yet 
in the process, his will is still accomplished. I think, again, go back to Moses. He's a, he's a young hothead. He grew up, you know, a, a child of privilege and wealth. He is like, he's in Pharaoh's family, but he sees his people. He, he knew he was an Israelite, and he saw the Israelites, and they're in slavery. He had this great plan. You know what? I'm going to free my people, and we'll start it off by murdering Egyptians. How'd that go for him? Yeah, not so well. He went from uh, murdering one Egyptian to uh, basically being found out, and he takes a, a, a 40 year time out in the wilderness because he runs away and he goes and becomes a shepherd, right? So he's gone from Pharaoh's house to keeping sheep. Not a great transition there, but God had a purpose for Moses, and part of that was learning who God was and how God works. And it, it took him 40 years to get Moses to the place he was ready to say, okay, now I am going to send you to rescue my people. God is patient. God's time and sense of time is nothing like ours. And yet in his patience, his will is still accomplished. And, and number three, can I just be honest with us? Yes? Okay. In general, number three, God's people are idiots. Uh, it, it was true then, and it's true now. I'm sorry, yeah, that, that, that does include us. Um, God calls his people sheep. We don't have a whole lot of sheep being ranched out here, but um, that is a, both a, a very endearing term, because the shepherd loves his sheep, right? But sheep are also dumber than dirt. They really are. And well, you can see examples. God sends Moses to save his people, right? And the first thing they ask when Moses gets there is, who sent you over us? God. Like, he answered your prayers. This is the whole They pray, rescue us, God, rescue us. And then as soon as he starts moving in power to rescue them, what do they do? What? They ball. They ball. Yeah, that's a good word for a sheep, yeah. They ball, they stop, and then they start complaining. It's like, no, 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 we want you to rescue us. Just not this way. Then, they're on their way out. They're following this God who has rescued them in power and in, in just majesty and, and might and overcome everything in Egypt. And they go out into the wilderness, and as soon as they get out there, they start complaining and saying, man, I just want to go back. Yeah, there she and then as we saw just a, a, a week or two ago, God gives the, his law to them. He gives them, this is how to have a relationship with me, that you can come close enough that my holiness doesn't toast you. And they all go, yes, Lord, we agree. And then Moses goes up to get the Ten Commandments on tablets, and 40 days, what do they do? They build a golden calf. They're like, hey, you know, Moses is taking too long. We need a God to worship. Forty days. They, they have encountered God like none of us ever have been able to see him just the glory covered in cloud and fire and all these miracles. And in 40 days, they go from, we'll do whatever you say to, we're going to break the second one you gave us. People are sheep. But, everyone say But. but. But in the course of this book, we've also seen God's grace. We've seen his power and his faithfulness. Last week, we had the privilege of being a part of seeing with Moses there on the mountain all of God's goodness as it passed in front of his eyes. We've gotten to see that God is holy, and yet in his holiness, he gives this law to his people and so that they can come as close as possible. Because that's his desire. His desire is not that they would see he's holy and be toast. His desire is that they would see his holiness, recognize it, and realize there is one way to come to him, and he has outlined that for them, and he wants them to come and have a relationship. And today, today I hope that we get to see, here in these last six chapters, the amazing connection between sacrifice, beauty, and God's perfect plan. Sacrifice, beauty, and God's perfect plan. So chapters 35 through 40 
in Exodus give us in great detail everything about the building of the tabernacle. It, it's a word that basically means tent, but it's a little more than that. God has explained to them how he wants this meeting place. That's what it means, the tent of meeting. How he wants this place set up. Because this is where his people are going to be able to meet with him. He's going to take his glory from the mountain that they aren't allowed to approach. And he's going to bring it right into the center of their camp. And he's, in their mind and in the way it's being described, he's going to dwell there. He's going to live there in the midst of them. And so he describes all this in great detail. And then that was earlier. Here in chapter 36, starting in verse 8, it goes into a very long process Talking about, okay, let's talk about the curtains and what the curtains are going to be made of and what they're going to look like and what, what pictures are going to be woven into them. It talks about the colors and the material they have to have. It talks about you know, having gold loops to hang them up on the top. And uh, it starts talking about all the, the wood, the acacia wood that's going to be, I guess, the floor. I'm, I'm not entirely certain as I'm trying to read through all of this. And the beautiful wood is going to be held together with silver sockets. And it talks about these posts that are holding up the curtains and the, the tent roof. And how they're made out of a hay of wood and literally covered in gold. And then it talks about this other guy. His job is going to be to make the Ark of the Covenant. You know the thing that Indiana Jones went after. He's going to make that. And it's made out of acacia wood. And on the outside, it's covered in gold. On the inside, it's covered in gold. The lid is covered in gold. And he, he shapes these two angels that, that cover the mercy seat. And it describes all of that. It talks about the, the, the table that the showbread is on. And I don't even remember what that's all about. But it, I have to dig into it. But he goes into the showbread. He goes into the lampstands. He goes into building the altar. And then you get into chapter 38 and start talking about all the curtains that are going to be on the outside. So you've got this whole beautiful thing being put together. And then you've got these linens on the outside that are held up with bronze posts and with silver loops. And they're going into all this detail. And then we get to the end of chapter 38 and you get a tally of the total cost. Just in the middle. Let's see. 29 talents and 730 shekels of gold. I worked that out. That's roughly 1,752 pounds of gold. Uh, 6,000 pounds of silver. 4,200 pounds of bronze. Uh, I, I looked at prices this morning and just kind of roughly adding all this together, we're talking around $32 million worth of precious metals to build the tabernacle. And that's not counting the curtains, the tapestries, the, the priest's linens, and, and the gems, and the, the precious stones that go into making all these things. And not that doesn't count labor. We all know labor doubles at least the cost of everything, right? And so these people have gone from receiving the law, right? They got the Sinai. God comes down on the mountain, and they're hearing God speak, and they're like, Moses, please don't make us have to sit through this. It's a little scary. They go from that to the dedication of this tent of meeting, the tabernacle, and it's one year to the day. So from the time the law is spoken, Moses goes up on the mountain and comes down 40 days later. From that time, it takes that year minus the 40 days or so to build this tabernacle. It is an enormous undertaking. It is a, a beautiful, beautiful construct, the, the, the likes of which you would find in, in, in the great temples of, of pagan gods, somewhere like in Egypt or in, um, in uh, Greece or later even in Rome. But it's not a temple. It's, it's a tent. It's made to move. And then as you're reading through this, honestly, if you were, say, reading through the Bible in a year, any of y'all ever undertaken to read the Bible in a year? If you were doing that and you were reading through it, you come to Exodus chapter 36, 37, you're probably just going to skim right over it. Because honestly, it's a lot of detail that goes over our heads. It, it, it's, it's a lot 
it's expensive, and people made this piece, and that person made this piece, and someone made a different piece. And we get the idea, it, it's over-the-top beauty, it's over-the-top cost. But it's really kind of like reading a construction log, if, if you did that sort of thing. It's like, okay, we're going to build our church, and, and today we use six pounds of nails and two pallets and two by fours to, to build the east wall, like the east wall and the north wall. And tomorrow we're going to use a different <coughs> Six pounds a minute. It's not really deep reading, right? And I'm okay with that. I'm not so much interested in you seeing the details of how many pounds of gold or, or whatever. Today I'm interested in all of us seeing the big picture. A picture of sacrifice, of beauty, and God's <coughs> plan. And we're going to work from backwards, all right? Let's start with God's plan. He hasn't been shy about it. It's not a, a surprise that what he is going to do to his people and through his people. He tells them at the very beginning, you will be my people and I will be your God. And he's keeping his promises to, to Jacob and Abraham and Isaac and all these promises he's made along the line. And he is choosing a people that he will later say, I have called you to be a nation of priests. Why? Because a nation of priests exists to show God to the world. And you and I know this side of the New Testament, we get it, that God is preparing the way for his son to come, for the Messiah, the Savior. But for any and all of this to happen, this beautiful tent of meeting and all the, the implements of worship they're going to use, first God has to make a way for his people to approach him. As we've already seen there in the first 40 days or so, God is holy. He's like, here's the limits of the mountain. Don't come on the mountain or you will die. If an animal of yours comes on the mountain, you've got to kill it. He's holy. We are not. We get that. They understand that. And yet he wants his people to understand, even though he is holy. He wants to know that. He doesn't want his holiness to kill them. He wants them to respect his holiness and come to him in relationship. So we get the law. As we've seen, we get the, 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 the words handed down by God, not just the Ten Commandments, but the Big Ten and all the rest that follow with it. And now he's, he's told us how to build the tabernacle, uh, or again, the Tent of Meeting, and they've done that, they're, they're putting it together. And this, this tabernacle, this Tent of Meeting is the place where God is going to meet his people. It is a place where they can come the closest to the presence of God as they possibly can. And in fact, the uh, end of chapter 40 tells us that that pillar of cloud and smoke um, and the glory of God that has been shining up on Mount Sinai, that all comes down when they finish. It comes down to the tent of meeting and it fills it and the, the pillar of fire and smoke will stay there. And it will be there, a physical illustration of God's presence with his people. A very real manifestation of God keeping his promise right there in the center of, his, of the encampment of the Israelites. And it tells us when the cloud was there and it wasn't moving, where when it stayed, the people stayed. And when it was time to move, the cloud would leave from the tent and go out, and the people would follow that cloud and smoke and fire. I mean, there's a whole sermon right there. God moved, his people moved. When he did, they did. But through all of this, you see God's plans, his intricate, beautiful, carefully woven plans, like, like the curtains on the inside of the tabernacle with the pictures on them. He's just woven all of this together. It, it, it's, it's a sermon illustration, if you will. A, a physical sermon illustration for God's people to point them to his purpose and to his plan for salvation. And it's beautiful. I don't know if you think about it. We don't really build things that are like anywhere close to this and elaborate and beautiful nowadays. We're a very utilitarian culture. If, 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 if your house has textured walls, it's like, mm -hmm. this was ordinary. 
ornate and over the top. The curtains inside were murals of, of, of angels and just the glory of God. The wood inside of it is, is oiled and polished until it glows, glows like gold, or they literally cover it over with gold. Over-the-top beauty that the artisans of Israel would spend almost a year making this wonder. And then for all of its beauty, for all of its majesty, this most beautiful thing that they could make becomes the veil between us, between the Israelites and the absolute perfect glory and beauty of God there in their midst. It is the most beautiful, most effort-filled, costly thing they could make with their hands. And that is where God comes to meet with them. I mean, just imagine, if you will, the most beautiful man-made thing you've ever seen. The most beautiful building you've ever been in. I haven't been in a whole lot, um, but I remember there's this one skyscraper, you know, in, what, maybe 30 stories? I don't know. But the atrium of it had like a 10 or 15 story atrium all enclosed in glass, a you know, waiting area out there. And I would just sit there waiting for whoever I was meeting with. And it was gorgeous. This huge enclosed glass space. And it just, it made you feel small and it made you just feel a little bit of awe. Or, or we went to D.C. and you're there at the Library of Congress. Now that's ornate. Or, or the Capitol building. I mean, everything is so detailed and so careful, and there are murals and pictures everywhere, and they all mean something. We don't do that anymore, but that's what this is like. It is, it is that awe of being surrounded by the highest efforts of humankind to make beauty and to communicate meaning. Take for a moment that and whatever you've experienced like that and realize whatever you felt in that moment, that, that amazement, and understand that, that feeling, that over-the-top amazement and awe at what we have done is the prelude everyone would feel coming into the presence of God. It is the prelude of encountering God. The highest of mankind's ability made as the foretaste glory of being in God's presence. There's a plan there. That's the beauty of everything he has put together. But how does he accomplish it? If you've been paying attention, I said we were going to read the chapters 35 to 40, but I started talking in chapter 36. You keep nodding. Yeah, great. Let me know. Let's go back to chapter 35 real quick and see what I jumped over. 35, verses 4 through 5. Moses spoke to all the congregation of the sons of Israel, saying, This is the thing that the Lord has commanded. Take from among you a contribution to the Lord. Whoever is of a willing heart, let him bring it to the Lord. Verse 10. Let every skillful man among you come and make all that the Lord has commanded. Verse 21. Everyone whose heart stirred in him, everyone whose spirit moved him, came and brought the Lord's contribution for the work of the tent of meeting and all its service and all the holy garments. Verses uh, 5 to 7 of 36. The skilled artisans said to Moses, The people are bringing much more than is needed for the construction, for the work that the Lord has commanded us. So Moses commanded the people, Stop! That's a sum up. Enough! Thus the people were restrained from bringing any more, for the material they had was sufficient and more to the task. I'm not going to lie to you guys, as a church leader, passages like that are just a little bit painful. Especially, as I hope you understand, I realize I struggle with the lie that somehow I'm supposed to motivate or, or manipulate and a people into getting more money because, you know, the church is always needing money, right? 
And there's this temptation, I'm telling you, it is straight from the devil. There is this temptation to twist a scripture like this into a guilt trip to squeeze everybody for a little bit more. But I recognize that. I recognize that is evil. I recognize that is from hell. But there is a balance. Now, I told y'all several weeks ago how my, uh, as we've been studying in Exodus, how my uh, understanding of the tithe has been challenged. Uh, for those of you who, who are visiting or new with us here, our guests, until two or three sermons ago, what I did teach and had consistently taught for 20-something years of ministry is that tithing, while good and blessed by God, is not required. It's not a commandment on the New Testament believer. Why? Because we're not under the Old Testament law. We are now free from that law, and instead, the Bible tells us, we are under the law of love in Christ Jesus. So our questions are no longer, should, ought I to do this or ought I not to do this? But rather, within the definitions of Scripture, our question should be, is this loving, is this not loving, and we should do what is loving. And I've always placed tithing on that pile of the old law. We give as Christians. We are commanded to give, but we give from love. Okay? And having said that, I've tithed my whole life. My wife has tithed her whole life. We, we give, we recognize it is an act of faith. And so, in faith, from the heart, we give, we tithe, because we know that pleases God, but it's not from obligation. 20 some years, that's where I've been on that subject. And then several weeks ago, as we are studying the Ten Commandments, and do we all agree the Ten Commandments are not like part of the Old Testament ceremonial law, right? They're the moral law. The Ten Commandments, you know, what is right and what's wrong, that never changed. And so as Christians, is it still wrong to murder? Yes, it is. I mean, that's, that's no, 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 no brainer. As Christians, is it wrong to lie about somebody? Yes. And you've got all these commandments in there, and, and, and they're still true. And then we hit, don't steal. Y'all would keep your smile you remember this. Are we supposed to steal? No, it's still wrong. But in the process of studying from it, I find that passage in Malachi, and it says, you're stealing from God. I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. <coughs> What do you mean we're stealing from God? I don't, it says not to steal, it is a moral issue. The last thing I'm going to do is steal from God. And God says, you're stealing from me by not bringing in the top. And I tell you, that worried me. And I'm still wrestling with what that means because, yeah, I get a high tide, not a big issue. But what am I teaching people? Because I take this word very, very seriously. And the last thing I'm going to do as a teacher, as shepherd, is to teach people, go steal from God, it's okay. I'm wrestling with that. And so, yeah, there is a balance. There's a balance between manipulating people into giving and teaching people truth about giving. And in this passage, guess what? There's some big truths. Let's cover a few of them. Truth number one. This is not a passage about the tithe. It is not. This, the tithe is an ongoing gift of maintenance to keep things running. This, here in chapter 35, and everything that happens afterwards, is a free will offering. It is a gift, no obligation, for a specific, limited purpose. So if you ever hear somebody preaching out of this passage about the tabernacle and everything everybody brought in, and they are telling you, you've got to do this, you've got to bring, you've got to give, you've got to, if they are guilting you or manipulating you out of this, you need to leave. You need to get out of that church. You need to turn off that program. You need to not go back. As someone who's manipulating the word of God to their own ends and milking you for money. This is not a passage about tithe. Number two, 
God's plan. God's plan in all its amazing beauty requires sacrifice. It's kind of the big picture of this story. God's plan requires sacrifice. The tabernacle was God's plan. It was going to be his, if you will, dwelling place among his people. And, and the illustration of the great salvation that he would bring about through his son Jesus. It was all a picture of what you and I now know in the cross and the empty grave. But it would never have gotten built. God's beautiful, perfect plan would never have gotten built without the sacrifices of his people. God's beautiful and perfect plans require sacrifice. Number three, that sacrifice is a sacrifice from and in joy. The people were not like, eh, we better go give, Moses is calling for money again. The people, okay, some of them might even have been like, yeah, I saw what happened last month, and you know, I don't really want to have like God come down on us again. Let's be, go ahead. Maybe there was some of that, I hope not. But generally, what we see in this is joy. The Lord commands, take an offering from whomever has a willing heart. Moses spoke to all the congregation, saying, This is the thing which, this is the thing which, saying, I have no idea what how that, anyway. Moses was saying to Israel, Take among you, from among you a contribution to the Lord. Let him bring it to the Lord, everyone whose heart is stirred, everyone whose spirit is moved. There was no coercion. There was no demanding. There was no guilt. There was only bring, if you will. And what was the response? Too much. Too much! Yeah, God had to tell the people to stop. Moses had to say, enough. We have more than we need. I love it. It says the people were restrained from giving. I picture them after Moses says stop. They're still coming up day after day going, I want to give this. And Moses is like, no, we don't have room for any more. You don't get that from guilt. You don't get that from manipulation. You get that from joy. And hopefully if you're good, Bible-digging, Bible-believing Christian, you can listen. Look at that passage. You'll read those chapters and you say, the word joy is not in there yet. We're going to stick to the Bible. It doesn't say they're giving because of joy. Where in the world do I get joy from? It's joy because the New Testament explains to us that everything we are seeing here in the book of Exodus, everything we see in the Old Testament, this this tabernacle, the sacrificial system, it is all a foreshadowing that is fulfilled in Jesus. And in John 1.14, we are told that the Word, Jesus, the eternal Word of God, became flesh and He dwelt among us. You remember that verse? The word dwelt there is tabernacled. That's the literal translation. He came into the tabernacle to be with us. And we saw his glory, the glory of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Hebrews 12 tells us, commands us, let us run, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Who? Jesus. Who? For the joy set before him endured the cross, despised the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. This free will offering of the people here at the beginning as the tabernacle is being constructed is a foreshadowing. It is a picture of where God is going to come down and meet with man. And it happens here in the people building the tabernacle. It also happens in God, in the person of Jesus, coming and making the way for us to approach the Father. And that way is the cross, and Hebrews tells us that happens through joy. 
Jesus made the offering in his flesh once and for all that we can be in the presence of the Father. And he did it for the joy set before him. And that brings me back to the main point of today's message. God's plans. God's beautiful, glorious plans. His plans for our good. His plans filled with grace and love of peace with the Father. His plans... He has intentionally made them in such a way that the beauty of his plans can only be manifest through the joy-filled sacrifices of his people. Through the joy-filled sacrifice of his son, we receive salvation. Through the joy-filled sacrifices of us, his children today, his word carries across the world. I'll tell you, over the years, even just in this church, I've had the, the blessing of seeing many joy-filled sacrifices. The building of this church in the first place, I wasn't here for that. But there were many sacrifices. And there were sacrifices made in the joy of seeing God's work accomplished here. I have seen the, the joy of this church pull together and buy a car, a van for somebody, because they needed a, a wheelchair-accessible van. And... They, his people, made that happen. I have seen the services of people time after time after time just taking care of people, meeting their needs. I have seen us come around families in time of loss and need and hurt and just surround them with the love of God. And I'm telling you, there was no ought to. We have not moved in sacrifice. Oh, man, that's what Jesus would want. Now, I'll be the first to say, there's some Sundays I get up like that, amen? Yeah. But where I've seen these great and beautiful plans of God come together, people have thanked God for the chance to be a part of that. I saw this Friday night. Because you guys, I'm proud of y'all. Y'all came together, <laughs> and y'all loved on some kids and some families, and it was gorgeous, and it was work, and oh my goodness, I'm getting older. We need young people to run after the kids, don't we? <laughs> oh. Daryl had no problem. I know. Daryl makes us all look, look bad, doesn't he? <laughs> Guys, there was joy there. It was chaotic, it was a mess, but there was joy. The sacrifices that lead to God's plans being fulfilled are sacrifices of joy. But that said, all of that said, I have never in, in my lifetime, not in the last 20 years of ministry, I have never seen a response so joyful, sacrificial, that we have to tell, or anyone's had to say, stop, that's enough. Never seen that. And I'm not saying that's a negative thing about us by any means. What I'm saying is, you know what? That says to me, we have not been given by God so great a challenge, so great a call, so great an opportunity that we went and said, Lord, that. So that's what I'm praying for this next year. I'm praying that God gives us great work for his glory, for his plans and his purposes. A work that will demand of us what can only come from great joy. Joy in the Lord and joy in our Savior. But I guess you could say from, from one point of view, I'm, I'm praying for the glory of God to be revealed and that is a wonderful thing. That is what we exist for. But if you want to flip it around, I guess, in a selfish way, can you be selfish with the joy of God? I'm praying that we would know the joy of the Lord, the joy that is our strength, the joy that comes from being children of the living God, the joy of our loving Father, who for joy sent His Son to the cross to win us all to Himself. Let's pray.